Welcome to Season 3 of Purposeful Empathy. My name is Anita Novak, and this show is all about amplifying the voices of people around the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. This episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by the fabulous Kim Smiley, who is CEO, but not Chief Executive Officer, Chief Empathy Officer, and Creative Director of Kim Smiley, a lifestyle brand. She is the founder and CEO of The Empathy Effect and The Empathy Empire Foundation. A Harvard-trained expert in compassion, Kim spent most of her career in the nonprofit sector enriching the lives of vulnerable populations. Kim shifted gears in 2014, launching her eponymous fashion brand that marries profit with purpose. Love it. An empathy activist, Kim inspires 275,000 followers in 75 countries through her nonprofit, The Empathy Effect and The Empathy Empire Foundation, which I can't wait to learn more about. This summer, Kim is being featured in The Social Movement, which is an Amazon Prime reality TV show that will solve some of the world's most pressing problems. Welcome so much to the show, Kim. Thanks so much for having me, Anita. So let's start with some background stuff. Why did you launch your social experiment, The Empathy Effect, on Facebook? Tell us all about that. So I was working in the nonprofit sector at the time, and I had an idea that I had had for five years that was kind of marinating in my imagination. And my idea was really a question. My question was, is empathy infectious? I thought it was, and I wanted to test that question or that hypothesis on social media, because basically I thought that what better place to test whether empathy was infectious than one on one of the most toxic platforms on the web. And I always thought that Facebook was quite toxic. So I chose as my laboratory Facebook because I thought if I could create a tidal shift in people's perceptions about empathy on a laboratory, if you will, as toxic as Facebook, then perhaps I could galvanize a movement offline as well. So what did you do? Walk us through it. Tell us what this is about. So it's a photo blog, basically, that started in 2015. I started it June 8th, 2015. And basically every day, except for Saturday, I posted a story about someone transforming the world through empathy. So it could have been something global or local, something small or something large. But it was always a planned act of empathy. I'm not really interested in random acts of kindness. I'm interested in deliberate acts of kindness and compassion. And so I sought to tell stories over the period of a year. And the stories were about kids, they were about animals, they were about adults, they were in Canada, they were in Africa, they were in Mexico, they were all over the world. And as the project gained velocity, what happened was people started populating the site with their own content. And that was when it became really interesting, Anita. So Can you share maybe one story that really sticks with you? It's got some sticky factor for some reason. And also, can you maybe share on a more personal note how this work and how being exposed to these stories has impacted you and changed your life? Absolutely. So I would say that day five was a magical day for my experiment because you never really know if something that is exciting or that like arouses your interest is gonna be interesting to other people. So on day five, the project went, it went global, I'd say, and it went viral. And I wrote a story about a doctor named Matthew Morton who has since passed away, but he's someone that I went to camp with in Montreal. And he was living in Toronto and he um, was a gynecologist obstetrician. And he was married to a beautiful friend of mine. She's since become a friend of mine, her name's Heidi Wilk. And on day five, we basically invited the internet to sing Matthew Morton happy birthday. He was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor when he was 32 years old, and he was given 18 months to live. And on day five of the empathy effect, it was his 37th birthday. So I thought, what better way to celebrate this man's beauty and his empathy than inviting the world to join in a chorus of empathy and sing him happy birthday. And so that's what I invited the internet to do. 
and it was a beautiful reaction and people joined in from across the world from I think we had different like a hundred different countries it was it was really astounding I had worked in marketing my whole career and I had never seen something as explosive as this because I think it just resonated with people on just such a basic human level this was a man who was a doctor he was a husband he was a father since he was diagnosed with cancer, he had two more children. So he was the father to very young children. And I think people just relished in the idea of bringing some joy to his life during a time where he was really struggling. And it was just so beautiful to see people united across the world in something so simple, just like wishing someone happy birthday, a stranger. And that really set us on a trajectory of I think massive growth with the empathy effect. And after that day, day five, we just started gaining more and more followers and Upworthy picked up the story of the empathy effect and MTV picked up the story. And, you know, this was just a little idea that I had in my head that I didn't think would necessarily have any relevance to anyone other than me. But, you know, often in life, you have to just put yourself out there and try things. I, um, it took me a long time to do it. Because as you know, Anita, like we're busy with so many different things in life. And um, I had a lot of things going on like everyone does. I had a full-time job. I had a side hustle as a jewelry designer. And I had this idea to spread empathy. And um, what was so beautiful about it was that the idea did resonate with other people. And uh, it just got stronger and stronger from there. Um, we, uh, we created something called the Confederacy of Dreamers, which was basically an opportunity for people to share their own stories of empathy. Because Anita, as you know, as someone who's an expert in empathy and spreading empathy, this isn't solitary work. This is community work and it's community building. And for one person to be talking about empathy is not that interesting. What's interesting is when you get a chorus of voices talking about empathy, when people are coming together to basically transition from slacktivism, which is just kind of like hitting like or share on a post, to actually performing empathetic acts. And that's what we did on day 365 of the experiment is we introduced hashtag the empathy pledge and we raised money um, for Matthew Morton's charity that was very close to his heart called High Lifeline, which allowed his kids to go on trips when he was sick and suffering and just allowed um, him and his wife Heidi to inject some normalcy into their lives. So we, we raised money and we created a pin. And the whole idea, Anita, and I'll end it here because I'm like, it's like a monologue and I have to stop talking, is um, the whole idea of the empathy pledge is that, um, you know, it's not complicated. Practice one act of deliberate empathy a day. And it's really that simple. And the world will be, have these ripple effects of empathy, right? If every person in the world practices one act of deliberate empathy, just the, the magic that can accrue is really transformational, I think. I believe that you're speaking to the converted, but I'm curious on a, on a deeply, maybe spiritual, at least personal basis, how have you been impacted by the empathy work that you've done? Some people would find this hyperbolic, the statement, but it's, it's true. So I'm going to put it out there. Empathy saved my life. Writing the empathy effect saved my life because that year I was suffering um, in the biggest way with infertility. And I, um, I actually got pregnant. I think it was like in the fifth month of writing the empathy effect or maybe the fourth month of writing the empathy effect. So um, it was very spiritual for me, the practice of finding the glimmers of hope and light in the darkness of my own life, just because I was literally writing the empathy effect from fertility clinics, like in the morning, you know, when you, you have to, not everyone knows this, but you know, when you're struggling with infertility, you're, you're going to the fertility clinic, you know, you're being poked and prodded like, like a, you know, like a voodoo doll. It's a very hard process. It's very taxing emotionally and spiritually. And so I say that empathy saved my life because it provided a lifeline for me to not get stuck in my suffering and to focus outward. And I think it really impacted my child as well, the one that I carried um, during the empathy effect, whose name is Samuel Raphael. He's my angel of healing. And I say that because my life during that one year period from June 8th, 2015 to June 8th, 2016, my life was immersed 
in empathy. I was interviewing people who were spreading empathy, who were embodying empathy. And, you know, there's something very magical about that, Anita, as you know. And my son was present for all those interviews. Every day of his life in utero was spent imbibing that. I, I believe in that. Um, you know, not everyone does. Maybe that's like woo-woo for some people, but I believe that inside the mother's energy and he was able to hear and feel the energy of the people that I was interviewing and photographing. And I have to say that my son is an empath and um, I don't think it's a coincidence that he's an empath. You know, um, during the, um, the, the, the year, and, and I gave birth to my son on August the 3rd, so I gave birth to him a couple months after um, the, the empathy effect was over, but my rabbi actually said to me that he was a gift that was given to me from the universe or God or however you want to call it for the work that I did to um, galvanize this empathy revolution in the world, which, you know, in, at the, by the end of the experiment, I think we had you know, over 150,000 followers. It's since grown to almost 300,000 followers. And it's not attributable to me or anything that's special about me. It's really attributable to the power of empathy and to the paucity of empathy online. People just, you know, it was kind of like um, the metaphor that I sometimes use is like a candle in an auditorium and just like it could light up the whole auditorium. Uh, that's kind of the reaction that we had online to the empathy effect is that people gravitated to the light that we were spreading through these incredible stories of regular people who were doing extraordinary things to change the lives of loved ones and also strangers. Oh, that's so beautiful. I, um, August 3rd, Samuel was born. What year? Uh, 2016. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So my daughter was born in May of the same year. I can really relate to a lot of the stories that you were talking about earlier. Maybe we'll introduce them in time. We'll do a little like Cupid matching uh, down the line. Um, bless you. I'm so happy that you, um, that you had him and that, um, that uh, he's showing up as an empath. And that's, that's, that's a beautiful gift. So I'm very happy for you. Um, gosh, so much to talk about. So what's the vision of the empathy effect going forward and the foundation as well? The vision is very lofty and some might say overly ambitious and unachievable, but <laughs> that's just the way that I think. So it's to start an empathy uh, revolution online. And my goal with the foundation is to create programming that educates people. A lot of people don't realize that you can train people how to be more empathetic. And so that's the work of the foundation is we're, we're going to be developing all kinds of programs to basically train people starting at the age of three and going all the way up to, you know, as, as old as people, you know, the elderly, I, I love working with the elderly. So I'd love to work with the elderly and do empathy training. Um, the oldest person I think I, I've taught empathy training to was in their late eighties. Um, but the goal is to really help people build their empathy muscles. And the way that I do that, Anita, is through interactive play. Um, play is a central part of my life. Like I'm a, I'm a person that loves play and that has maintained my childlike sense of wonder. And I think that that is the pathway, in my opinion, and it's the pathway that I use to teach empathy to others, is by adopting the lens of a child and the sense of wonder of a child and harnessing the imagination in order to build those empathy muscles that we all have. Some are born like you as just empaths that are brimming with it when, you know, when they're born, when they come out of the womb and other people, they need to exercise those muscles like they would exercise their biceps in working out. It's the same kind of thing. And so I've created some curriculum that originally was going to be taught at my flagship location at Eglinton and Bathurst in Toronto. But due to COVID and the necessity of pirouetting into new possibilities, we are now taking our training online, which is actually a good thing because it'll allow us to really spread our message globally. Wow. Okay. So do you have information on your website about this training that we can drop in our description below? So the empathy training is going to be starting probably in June. Okay. We, um, we're tying it into my fashion business as well, because for me, fashion without purpose is really devoid of meaning. I'm not really interested in beauty for beauty's sake. I'm interested in beauty for a purpose. So what we're doing with my fashion business is 
starting probably in June, what we're going to be doing is every time someone purchases a piece of jewelry, they're going to receive a link to free empathy training. We're going to be teaching an empathy class with every purchase of jewelry. And my goal is to teach 1 million empathy classes. So it's quite ambitious, but I think it's achievable. Um, and I'm really, really excited about it. So what do you think is, what, what called you to empathy? You said you were mulling around for five years, the idea of the empathy effect before you actually you know, decided to, to, to go for it. Why do you suppose this was such an important thing for you? I think this goes way back, way, way back to my childhood. My parents took us on a trip, my brothers and I, I was three, my brothers were five and seven, and they took us on a trip around the world. Well, we actually were in Asia. So we stayed for a year and traveled basically across Asia. We started in Israel, and then we got a car in Turkey and just started driving east. And I think my parents really shaped my perception at that very formative age to not focus on myself. You know, my brothers are, are the same. We were taught to look outward and we were taught to, um, to really, to, to not sort of be um, stagnant or privileged. I think that's the best way to put it. Now, what also caught my attention while you were speaking, and for those who are listening to this as a podcast, you may want to make note to come back to the website to actually see this with your eyes. But for those who are viewing this as a YouTube uh, episode, in your gesticulation, I had the chance to see your beautiful jewelry. You're a designer. So can you share a little bit about your pieces and, you know, some of the, the philosophy of the brand? Absolutely. So I've been an artist since a really early age, self-taught. When we were on that trip, I used to play with the tribal jewelry that my mom collected. And so we didn't have a lot of toys on the trip because we were, you know, when you're traveling, you want to travel light. And so um, the seeds of this business were planted, I'd say, um, you know, in, in Kathmandu, like in the summer of 1979, uh, when I was traveling with my parents on this trip. And I've always loved beauty. I've always loved fashion, but I never thought I could make a go of it full time because one of the things my parents also taught me was how important it was to have a stable career and to make my own money. <laughs> and so being an artist never really was never on the radar screen as something viable as a career. And I, so I basically did it as a side hustle. I was a vice president at a big charity in Toronto and I would wake up very early in the morning in order to work on my art. I call it wearable art. Um, just because I'm a mixed media painter and the business actually organically developed out of the creation of a mixed media painting that I did. And um, so basically what happened was I pursued um, my career in nonprofit. And um, in 20, um, 2015, I decided to resign from my position at a charity. And the year prior, I had debuted my collection at World MasterCard Fashion Week. And I, I felt like such an imposter. Like I went from being an executive at a nonprofit, you know, dressed like in a suit to, um, you know, appearing at Fashion Week as a designer and just like trying to present myself in a totally unique new way, a unique way. And um, I took two vacation days off. And um, that was really, really formative. I did it with the Toronto Fashion Incubator. And, um, and it was really exciting and it was met with, um, a lot of attention. And the reason why it was met with attention is aside from the fact that I use lace, my jewelry is all made out of lace. Like everything is hand sewn out of lace and I hire women who are newcomers to make it. That's really the reason the company got so much attention at Fashion Week. And it sort of launched um, the company really in the public imagination just because I was marrying, like you said at the beginning, profit and purpose. For me, it was never about just the jewelry that I would find that very boring. It was about the incredible process of creating art with other women. So my company is really about elevating women, the women who make this jewelry, and the women who wear it, it's this gorgeous karmic cycle. And what happens um, with, the, with the jewelry is that I design it and my jewelry is really a celebration of color and a celebration of contrast. Um, I'm really into um, the idea that everyone who works for my business, for my brand is an ambassador of joy. 
the world is very dark right now. There's lots of suffering. So I feel that we have a role to play in spreading joy and beauty through this jewelry and all these other products that we're going to bring to the market. Um, and what's so great about it, Anita, is that when you wear it, it it's very empowering because of the way that it was made. You know, um, I say that like empathy is laced into the jewelry because we're empowering women with meaningful work. One of our seamstresses, Nairi, from Syria, from Aleppo, fled the genocide in Aleppo. Before that, they fled the genocide in Armenia. These are incredible women with stories of hope and survival. They're the people that are making the jewelry. And because of that, it's imbued with this beautiful karmic energy and this goodness. And we pay a living wage, which is something that's very important to me as opposed to a minimum wage. Because as you know, fashion can often be a very unempathetic industry. So my whole vision is to inject empathy into an industry that has a paucity of empathy. So uh, to bookend this little part, because that has been a, a fantastic story about your brand, um, I would like to just encourage any listeners or viewers um, to pay attention to the timing of this video. And maybe a seed has been planted for a sister or a cousin or a mom or somebody in your life who might uh, enjoy a piece from kimsmiley.com. So um, tell me about your title. You've named yourself Chief Empathy Officer. I mean, I kind of, I kind of know the answer, but go for it. Why did you do that? The Chief Empathy, Empathy Officer really comes from the fact that I think my role in the business is to provide the creative direction. I'm also the creative director of the company. But I, I set the values of the business. And um, my partner is a very philanthropic person. He really, I, it's not that he's adopted the values, it's, it's that he breathes the values already. But if people go to the site, you could see the values that we lead with. And it's all about generosity and empathy and judging favorably. And um, it's interesting because if you just looked at it in isolation, you wouldn't necessarily think that it was a fashion company. But it is a fashion company because my whole goal with this business is to create a lifestyle brand that puts empathy top of mind and that, you know, people need to understand and there needs to be an awakening around the fact that outer beauty is really not that interesting. You know, I, I love beauty as much as the next girl. I love fashion as much as the next girl. But at the end of the day, I spend way more time cultivating my inner beauty, cultivating my empathy muscles than I do putting on makeup and doing my hair. Like, I think it's a really important message for young people to get. And it's at the heart of what we're gonna be teaching with our empathy classes. So although I'm kind of like, I'm enticing people to come through the door with the beauty of fashion, you know, and the beauty of color. These are things that I embrace and love as an artist. I think that I want them to stay and to really get hooked on the empathy. That's really what I'm most passionate about is creating social change and creating more kindness in the world, but just doing it through something that's fun, less selfies, you know, and more unselfies, like more, how can we inject more beauty into the world, not by how we look, but by how we show up for others. So how do you deal with the critics and the skeptics? Because when you were talking earlier about uh, the empathy effect and the stories that were being shared, I can just imagine how all of the naysayers and haters are like, really, she thinks she's going to change the world with empathy. So on one level, you know, like, how do you deal with that? But also like on a, at a vulnerable level, how do you deal with that? That's a great question. So the way that I dealt with that through 2015, because so I launched the business in 2014, I launched the Empathy Effect in 2015, is it was kind of like keeping church and state separate. I never connected the empathy work I did with the jewelry up until a couple months ago. I kept them completely separate. So there was no allegation that could be made that I was trying to use empathy for some kind of corruptible purpose, like trying to get people to buy stuff. That was never my MO. It was never my intention. And the way that I established that credibility is I didn't do it. So for over, um, you know, we're, we're in 2021. Um, so for the first six years of the empathy effect, I never had it have anything to do with money. You know, there is a tremendous amount of skepticism, Anita. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of cynicism. 
Um, and I, I do sometimes get that cynicism. Like I hear it and I feel it. And sometimes people project it onto me. And I think the best way to deal with the cynicism and the skepticism is through complete and utter transparency. So we have a very transparent process in terms of our model of how we produce like our supply chain. We're vigilant. We have, um, we've hired a, a person to, to do our back end for us, a woman named Joan, who's like an angel. And Joan is a holy woman. She's a very spiritual woman and she's in charge of our manufacturing and production. So it was very important to us as a business to hire someone who understood how, sanct how sanctity of life and how people um, and purpose were at the top of our pillars in terms of our values. And that's the way we conduct the business. And that's my role as chief, chief empathy officer is to ensure that the integrity of the production, you know, as we get larger and I have plans to make this into a massive company, um, we will maintain that uh, integrity in terms of our manufacturing. I have plans needed to go into Israel to have Jewish and Arab women working side to side to create pathways of peace. I want to go into Mexico. I want to go to Bali. In every country that Kim Smiley produces in, we're going to bring that mindset of the living wage. We're going to bring it to bear on how we manufacture because we're all about empowerment. And, you know, it would be just heartbreaking for me to be, um, you know, caught up in something that wasn't elevating women. Um, that, that's the reason I'm doing this is to elevate people and to bring light and beauty into their lives. So the skeptics will come, right? Like the more notoriety you get, the more visibility you get. Oh, they come. Like I, I, I often say to the team here that the more light we spread, the more shade we're going to get. And that's okay because, um, we are conducting ourselves with transparency and integrity and I, you know, people can bring the dark. That's okay. I don't mind. I think it's actually important because it'll sharpen my messaging and it'll make us even more transparent. And because we're so proud of our business model and the integrity of our operations and how we empower women, I wanna shed light on it. And I want, like, if people have, you know, questions or any kind of cynicism, I wanna hear it because it'll, it'll allow us to up our game and to show people how we're manufacturing locally and just making a difference. I wonder if you have a story of how you lived the experience of someone showing you a deliberate, purposeful type of empathy and how that um, touched you. So in terms of an experience where someone has really shown me purposeful empathy and um, really showed up for me in that way, I would say when I was working full time, I had my side business, I had the empathy effect, I was, do I was you know, juggling all these things at the same time. I, I didn't launch the empathy effect, Anita, like, as I said, until I left my full-time job. But I was shown so much empathy by my employer, by my last employer. Um, I just, you know, we, we had a couple of, um, of people that were, um, that were just extraordinary in how they showed up for me because I was really struggling with infertility. And I had decided to leave my full-time job because I, I didn't think that I could have a baby while I was working full time, I just thought the stress was too much, the pressure was too much, and I suffered, you know, many miscarriages while I was working full time. And this is something that a lot of women who are listening can relate to. And one of the ways that I was just so uplifted when I was working for someone else, and this was the last time I worked for someone else, was at UJ Federation. There were two people. Um, Adam Minsky, who's the CEO of UJ Federation, and a guy named Steve Schulman who I was working with in a fundraising capacity at UJA. And, you know, these men, neither of whom obviously understood what it was like to lose a baby, right? These men just showed me the most purposeful empathy that I had ever experienced in my life because I had a senior job and I was expected to perform and to produce. And I, I did. I, I, I worked really hard, but I was really suffering and really struggling. And the kindness and compassion that they showed to me was just, it's something that I'll never forget. And it's something I'm so grateful for. Beautiful. Well, I'm so glad I asked and I look forward to you sharing the link so that you can um, point to the timestamp where you're talking about these two gentlemen that sound like they were great mentors. And I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, 
through very difficult times that, um, that they were there for you. Showing purposeful empathy, as you said. So um, we'll end the formal interview here. Again, reminder to check out the details in uh, the description below. Visit kimsmiley.com. Thank you so much, Kim, for sharing your enthusiasm. Uh, it's very contagious and I love the message of empathy that is woven through your work. So thank you for thank watching. You Thanks for listening. Have a great day. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from whatever is holding you back? At Grant Here in International, you get to select the coach of your choice anytime from any place. Visit GrantHereInternational.com to harness the power of on-demand coaching today.